plagues, plagues. What in the world are we going to be talking about? Tony's right. How do you preach? How do you sing about plagues, huh? Blood. Rivers turning to blood and fi stinking dead fish. Well, that's what, what. What are these plagues all about? Why are they there in the Bible? What's the purpose of plagues? Well, I think we're going to find some answers here. <clears throat> and God's Word always has the answer. You know that. In chapter 7, we're going to read just verse 1 through 7 as we, as we begin. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh and your brother Aaron. You shall be your prophet. You shall speak all I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt with great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so. They did just as the Lord commanded them. Now Moses was 83 and Aaron 83. Um, Moses was 80 years and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. If they were both 83, they'd have been twins. Sorry about that. So what's going on here? We are at the beginning of plagues plagues that are going to come to Egypt because the Pharaoh's heart has been hardened by himself to start with, and then God hardened it further. So he's not going to listen. But the plagues have two, two important purposes, two themes that we're going to follow all through this part of Exodus as we see the plague. So why have plagues? Number one, the first is to show the power of God to deliver. Let my people go. Let my people go. Why? So they can worship me. And you remember that the same word in Hebrew we talked about last week, that they will bow down to God, worship God. They were bowing down to Pharaoh now. I want them out of Pharaoh's land where they're bowing down to him. I want them bowing down to me. I want to deliver. So the first theme is that God is delivering his people so that they may worship him and have that relationship with him. The second purpose through his mighty works and judgment and plagues are part of God's mighty works along with other things that we'll see in a minute. But the second purpose, the second theme is right there, that the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord. Through this chapter, this, this phrase is repeated, that you will know, the Israelites will know that I am the Lord, that everyone, the people will know that I am the Lord. So, these the two purposes are to help us to be delivered from where we're worshiping. We're going to see that to where we'll be worshiping God so, and so that they may know. And you remember that word know in Hebrew that means something a lot more than just know the name of God. Know is used for a relationship intimate relationship between man and woman, their wives, the husband will know their wife. That means they have an intimate relationship. And that's what God wants with us. That knowing means an intimate, personal relationship with God. And that is what he wants, that you may know, that they may know that I am God. But God's hardened the heart of Pharaoh. 
Now, he said Moses will be like God to Aaron, and then Aaron will speak to Pharaoh. But what this shows that God is in control of everything. And his miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, one of the purposes is that they will know that he is God. There's an interesting... Jesus spoke these almost exact same words. You remember in John 9, about the blind man. He was blind since birth, and Jesus had passed by. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked this question. You remember this, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You remember that, right? He's blind, something's wrong with him. Who sinned? And he answered, Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents sinned, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. Jesus, right there, is repeating exactly what the Old Testament is teaching us now. These signs are going to be demonstrated in him healing. And the, one of the main purposes, and then a beautiful psalm that teaches us that in Psalm 67, that the world may know all of God's works are in 67 too, so that made so that you may be known on all the earth, that your glory and power will be known. And that's what Jesus, the Lord is saying right here, that you will know me, have that relationship with me. Now, when we look at all of Scripture, we see that these mighty works of God are revealed. And we don't need to fully understand all this because there's really, and we could spend hours thinking about this. Just, just put this in your mind and think about it. And I know a lot of you are thinkers in this room. But why did that blind man have to stay blind until he was an adult? Why did it take all those plagues? Why didn't Pharaoh let him go after two or three plagues? Why did it take so much before, before God's was made known? We don't have these answers. These are tough questions. We don't have these answers, but we know the reason. God has a plan. His plan is perfect. He knew his plan from the foundation of the earth. Before the earth was even formed, he knew what he was going to do. So I'm not questioning God at all. But these are things that we contemplate, and we don't need to understand. Why? Because... We will never, as humans, fully understand any of this, okay? Until when? When will we understand fully? When is that day going to happen that you know all the answers to these tough questions? When? 1 Corinthians 13, last verse in that chapter. That's the love chapter. We will fully know just as we have been fully known. When we are with the Lord at the end of time, when we are in his heaven, we will fully know just as we are fully known right now. God knows everything about us. And when we're with him, all these questions that you have, that I may have, they're going to be answered. But not until then. Our little pea brains as humans on this earth, we can't comprehend the glory of God completely. And so we will always have questions we don't understand. But we need to understand this. There is a purpose. These two purposes, one is to free us from what we're worshiping so that we can worship God and the second is through these mighty acts, all through Scripture. In Exodus, we're going to see tons of them. The sea is going to part. They're going to go up to Sinai, see all the lightning, the Ten Commandments. They're going to see a rock 
burst forth with water. You ever seen that? We're going to see birds falling out of the air. I love seeing that when I'm hunting. That's fun. Sorry, that may offend some of you, but, but they didn't have to hunt. They were just in the desert. Bam, birds flopping all down. Quail, that's good eating, brother. And they're falling out of the sky. Man has fallen out of the sky. They're going to see mighty acts of God. But the mightiest act, all of this points to the greatest act of Jesus being born as that baby in the manger, coming to us as 100% God, 100% man, coming, God in us, and his death and resurrection. That is the ultimate revelation. And even, think about this, even in that, don't you see, when Jesus died on the cross, there's judgment. Jesus bore our sins. There's judgment. He had to die. And that we still shake our head. And then that's why all of these questions will be answered. But he had to die. There was judgment so that we can have grace. There's judgment that Jesus went to the cross and he paid the price. So he freed us. We don't bow down to Pharaoh. Is Pharaoh running Giles County right now? Who do we bow down to now? We bow down to our sin, to Satan's self, the temptations that we fall to, to my pride, my greed. Jesus wants to, his judgment, that wrath that we feel, that guilt that we feel, as we talked a few weeks ago about the wrath of God that remains on us that don't love God, that's there even though it feels painful and it hurts. It's a loving act to draw us. That judgment draws us to Jesus and his grace and his deliverance so that the world may know as we come to him in faith, we can share that with other people. And we worship God now because we've been brought out of that judgment into that right relationship with Jesus. God is righteous and holy and all-powerful. His judgments are perfect, even though we may not understand them completely, because they lead to his deliverance of us from the bondage of what we were worshiping, the deliverance of us so that we can worship him and that the world may know that he is God. This next little section of verses in 7 through 13, very interesting. They went to Pharaoh and said, the Pharaoh said, prove yourself by working a miracle. Then you shall say to Aaron, take your staff, cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. And listen to this. Then Pharaoh summoned his wise men and the sorcerers and the magicians of Egypt, and they did the same thing by their secret arts. Same thing. For each man cast down his staff, and they became servants. But, but, whenever there's a but in Scripture, focus. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs, but still Pharaoh's heart was hardened and he would not listen as the Lord had said. So kind of the warm-up in the batting box, the warm-up, Aaron threw down his, his staff. And the interesting thing in, in preparing, the Hebrew word that's used here is not just a little rattlesnake or a copperhead, whatever. It's a giant snake. And actually the word that is used is not for snake. It's actually the word for crocodile. So he threw down his staff and bam, there's this crocodile laying, you know, squirming on the ground. But Pharaoh's guys did the same thing. But listen to this. His crocodile 
ate all of theirs. And so their powerful staffs were gone. And then his turned back into Aaron's staff. So Aaron, they conquered all of the, all of the alligators, the crocodiles that these magicians threw down. But this word swallowed up is an important word because it is pointing clearly to a truth. These magicians work by what power? An evil power, right? An evil power. And they had power to do some things, but the power of God overcame and swallowed up those evil crocodiles from those magicians and sorcerers. Um, and there is a similar word in the New Testament that is used and is swallowed up. And this swallowing up, you may remember these uh, verses. I'm going to read um, 1 Corinthians 15, 53 through 56. Um, For this perishable body, you may remember these at, at a funeral even, must be put, must put on the imperishable. And this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death <clears throat> is swallowed up in victory. Remember those words? Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where's your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is in the law, but thanks be to God who gives us victory for our Lord Jesus Christ. Death is swallowed up in victory. God's word says the same thing over and over and over. And what we just saw demonstrated in this act of crocodiles eating a bunch of other crocodiles is spoken again through the Holy Spirit as Paul was writing in Corinthians, just like that crocodile swallowed up the other crocodiles, death, which is from wages of sin is death. Death is swallowed up in victory. Same word, swallowed up in victory because God's power, his glory, his grace through his son on the, his sacrifice on the cross, that ultimate revelation has swallowed up death. And that's an amazing thing to think about that God gives us a glimpse of in Exodus and then shows how it's going to work through his son, Jesus Christ and how we have the victory, the victory over death. So sometimes we see the judgment and we see evil things and we get worried, but God will overcome evil. Because with judgment comes salvation and grace and Every power, every evil force is swallowed up and overcome. When Jesus comes again in this, his second coming, when he comes in the clouds, all that's going to be swallowed up. Satan will be thrown into the abyss for a thousand years and into the lake of fire. It's going to be swallowed up. It's going to be gone. And we are going to have victory for eternity with our Lord because of this great power that God is demonstrating to us right now in Exodus. God is righteous. He is holy, all-powerful, and his judgments are perfect. They lead us to deliverance and to worship him so that the world may know that he is God, and God's power will overcome Satan and overcomes death in our lives this very minute through the cross of Jesus Christ. Praise God. I'm going to close with a stinky river.
This is um, this is going to smell a little bit. In, ver in verses uh, 14, they said to Moses, uh, Pharaoh's heart's hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Um, the Nile River was the lifeblood of Egypt. You know, that's where, particularly as it fed into the Mediterranean, where all their agriculture, their cotton, their wheat, they, they were the breadbasket of that world at that time. They grew everything. They would be like Kansas and all of our uh, middle America that grows enough food to feed almost the entire world. They were the breadbasket. Stand on the bank. So he's going, by the, he's going to the river probably to wash up and stuff. Stand on the bank of the Nile and meet him. Take in your hand the staff that turned into a serpent. And you'll say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me. Let my people go that they may serve me in the wilderness. But so far you've not obeyed. Thus says the Lord, by this you'll know, you will know, here we go. You shall know that I am the Lord, Yahweh. With the staff in my hand, I'll strike the water in the Nile. It shall turn to blood. The fish in the Nile will die. The Nile will stink. And the Egyptians will grow weary of drinking the water of the Nile. And the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, take your staff, stretch it out in your hand over the waters of Egypt, the rivers, the canals, the ponds, and all their pools, so that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, even in the vessels of wood and the vessels of stone. Well, they did that. And the Nile stank in verse 21. They had a stench. It stunk. They couldn't drink the water. But the magicians somehow were able to do the same thing. We don't know quite how that works out. But they, and so Pharaoh went back to his house and said, forget it, Moses. This is nothing. My guys can do what you just did, what your God just did. But that is an amazing thing. Uh, the, the life of the Egyptian people has turned to blood, and all of their fish have died. It is stinking. It's a smelly mess. If you've ever been around a bunch of dead fish, like in a, some sort of accident where there are a bunch of fish floating, I mean, it stinks. And that's what the whole area in Egypt was doing. And, you know, we laugh at Pharaoh. How can Pharaoh be so stubborn? We laugh. But all throughout scriptures, Israel does the same thing. You remember this. They see these great wonders, but yet in the, in the desert, they turn their back on God over and over and over. They fuss to God. And let's, let's, um, let's bring this home because we laugh at Israel. How can Israel keep rejecting God, turn away from God? How can they do that? Well, as I've said over and over, when we think that, we need to look in the mirror. We need to look in the mirror. Every time, you know, I'm shaving. Um, ladies, you know, you're kind of doing your hair, putting on stuff. When you look in that mirror, every time you look in that mirror, you're going to see somebody who does the same thing as Pharaoh, who does the same thing as Israel. Because we put so many other things in front of God. We put money, we put traveling, we put uh, sports, we put football games, we put whatever. We put lots and lots of things before God. Then all of a sudden, our lives do what? What do our lives do? They start to stink. You know, I mean, you may not smell it, but you think, my life is just not going well now. It stinks. And that's when we need to look in that mirror. Okay, what happened? What happened in my life? Lord, forgive me. I have turned away from you. I've been following something else, and I've ignored you, and my life is stinking now just like that stinky 
river. And when we repent and turn back to him instantly, he restores us. He forgives us. He gives us that right relationship back in our lives. I've told you, and it's the truth, I'm the chief of sinners all through my life. I've had to look in that mirror and say, boy, my life is stinking right now. I'll never forget one time, and unfortunately, my oldest daughter is here to hear this, but in my 40s, some, I don't remember, you know, I'm, I'm an old guy, so time just, I can't remember it all. I was somewhere in the middle of my life. And I thought, and I was greedy, you know, money was kind of, I was investing. I thought I was really a a great investor and so, so smart. And there was, um, when I look back, when I look back, you know, I shake my head at Israel. I look back and shake my head at myself. So I, there was some investment guy I was following and there was a, a diamond mine in Africa, I kid you not, a diamond mine in Africa that was supposed to have a mother load. Mm -hmm. Seriously, think about that. And I invested in that. And I lost almost all of my kids' college funds. Brilliant. And I looked in the mirror and I said, Lord, I stink. And he said, yes, you do, Bob. You stink. You're stinking up this place. And I repented. And and I and I turned away from that greed. I turned away from that attitude. And somehow God provided. Seriously, he did. We were able to get four kids through college, and and truly he blessed me. In a, in a miraculous way, we were able to do whatever we had to do, and the kids all went to school. And they graduated, yay, and went on to be adults in their lives. But my life stunk just like that smelly river because of my pride, my greed, and thinking I'm some great investor, and looking back doing such an ignorant, foolish thing. Somehow, I don't think I'm the only one in this room who can look back in their lives look and, and see some times when you have done similar things. Maybe not money. Maybe something else you did. I was so dumb doing that. Well, that's our world. We are in a fallen world. We are fallen creations. We are filled with pride and greed and selfishness. But yet, this is the whole purpose of the plagues and this judgment that we see from the plagues. Because God is righteous and holy all the time. And we see his judgments. They are perfect. And they demonstrate his power so that he can deliver us from bowing down to greed, from bowing down to money, from bowing down to whatever we are worshiping. And he delivers us so that we bow down to him. And the purpose of that is so that the world may know him through our lives, through our testimony, when we've messed up and we share that with a friend who's struggling with the same problems. The world may know that he is God. God will overcome all evil, just as those crocodile, as staff of Aaron ate up those other crocodiles. God overcome. And yes, even death is swallowed up, just like those crocodiles, swallowed up in victory, victory through Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And so if our lives are stinking it up, are a little smelly right now. Look in the mirror. See, may God convict you, as he has me over and over and still does, that you're on the wrong path, Bob. Get back 
on my path. 